Okay, so it is my pleasure and my honor to chair this session with uh, an invited talk, which will be live and alive because it will be given by two speakers at the same time. Okay, well, not at the same time, one after the other, of course. Okay, the first one to talk will be Ellen Pimentel, who is very well known. She's a full professor at the Mathematics Department of Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, or Brazil, in Brazil, sorry. Uh, her research interests are broad in logic. Uh, she works in proof theory, in concurrency theory, in game semantics, logical frameworks, linear logic, model logic, lambda calculus. She has been a conference chair of CAID in 2099, and she's PC member of a lot of international conference and workshops, more than 20, I believe. Sonia, Sonia is a young, brilliant researcher. Actually, she is a research fellow at University College London. And she actually made her PhD in uh, Université Paris-Saclay, Ecole Polytechnique, so near Paris. And her PhD was on model proof theory and focusing. Then she did her postdoctoral research at the Technical University of Copenhagen in a verification project. And now, as I said, she's a research fellow at University College. Okay, so I guess that now it's the right time to give the word to Ellen. Ellen, please go ahead. Thank you, Serenella. Uh, thank you for the very, very, very nice words and very nice presentation. So uh, I would like also to thank uh, yeah, the ISCAR uh, committee and uh, that um, had chosen my name to be invited speaker. I'm really, you know, it, it was really a fantastic, uh, fantastic thing that happened to me. Um, and uh, I'm really happy about it. And uh, so, yeah, so as Serenella said, so let me just uh, first talk a little bit about this, uh, this project. So uh, I, I'm really, uh, it's a very nice project and I'm really happy to be part of it. And uh, we, we're in a very good company. So th there are two things that I like the most about this project. The first is the company, of course. So I'm with Sonia and Sonia is a very, as you said, very bright uh, young researcher and a very nice friend. And, uh, um, but this is also a joint work with Dale Miller, who was my PhD advisor and uh, with, with whom I've been working uh, for quite some time now and with Marco Volpe. Um, Marco is Italian, but now he's working in, uh, in, uh, in Germany in Fortis. So uh, the second thing that I like a lot about this work is that it's based on uh, lots of uh, uh, literature or, or research uh, that, uh, completely uh, changed my life, let's say. I, I really enjoyed uh, reading papers that I'm going to talk about today. So um, it's based, the, the, the grounds are really uh, very nice ones, very nice ones and uh, uh, important to me and my career. So let me start uh, just explaining the, 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 the problem we're going to track of. So it's a very old problem actually. So it's the axioms as rules problem. So we are going to, what we're going to do in this talk is to show you how we can uh, take this old problem that I think it's uh, quite nice, nice and inter interesting for many aspects, many aspects and give to it a very new, uh, a very fresh view of it, right? So the way that we're going to do this is to uh, do a combination of bipolars and focusing and, and uh, provide rules for atomic formulas. So instead of uh, having introduction rules for connectives, for example, or structural rules, we're going to have uh, uh, rules for atomic formulas. So this is what the talk is going to be uh, about and the project is on. So let's start with uh, some motivation first. So uh, we are going to talk all the way about first order logic, okay? Either classical or intuitionistic uh, logic and first order. And uh, the formalism that we, we chose uh, to reason about uh, first order logic is sequent calculus. And why? Well, sequent calculus has some very good properties. So for example, it's simple. Uh, uh, it's really easy to understand what's happening, uh, what's going on. 
has very good uh, proof theoretical properties for, for example, for classical in intuitionistic first order logic, like for example, elimination interpolation consistency, you name it. Uh, and it, it can be easily implemented. So uh, you can do, so we're going to show some implementation today in Lambda Prolog, but you know, you could use rewriting or, or uh, other framework or the programming language that you, you like uh, for this kind of reasoning. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is to put on the top of it mathematical theory. So this is a very nice idea, right? I mean, why? Because you're going to take mathematical theories and then you're going to plug this on the first order logic that you already have all the machinery given by sequence calculus. And then you can use all this machinery to reason about this, this theory as well. So this is a very nice idea. And actually it's a so nice idea that uh, there are lots of people worked on that um, uh, before, right? So um, as I said, this, this work has, is based on um, lots of uh, research on, uh, that has been done by people that uh, I really, really enjoy. So the first one uh, that I would, uh, I would uh, mention is the word in 98, and this is not a chronological uh, on the, the time that was published or um, or the, the, the problem was, uh, was uh, studied, but it's chronological in the way that I studied the thing, right? So the first one for me was the, the paper of uh, Saranegri and uh, Jan von Plato from 98, where they give a very nice introduction and explain you know, uh, step by step everything that happens when you try to do that, I mean, to plug mathematical theory on the top of sequence calculus for first order classical in, the, in, in that case logic, right? So this is a, is a very, a very nice paper, very well written. Uh, it's endless, so you can still read it and it's, it's still at, actual. And then later on, uh, Sara and Roy uh, did a very nice, uh, had a very nice uh, work that I'm going to talk at the end a little bit more, um, uh, talking about um, how can you take any axiom in first order uh, logic and actually plug it into, uh, sequen into the sequence calculus of first order logic. Uh, then uh, for me, it came uh, Alex Simpson uh, when uh, in his uh, PhD thesis uh, on modal logic. So it's like uh, now we, we're moving to a, a fragment of first order logic. So in this, in this uh, work, he, uh, he plugged uh, some theories, some uh, relational theories on the top of uh, both uh, sequence calculus and natural deduction actually started with nat natural deduction. And this was a breakthrough for me. And then uh, the other ones that I, I really enjoyed reading was the book of Luca Viganò in 2000, uh, also about modal logics and relational theories and how to plug uh, the, this uh, theories on the top of uh, sequence calculus and natural deduction. And, uh, and uh, finally, Agata, Agata Ciabattoni, that uh, she, uh, she did the same, but for uh, substructural logics. It, uh, not quite the same, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, the paper of 2008, they are more interested, uh, so it was Ciabatoni, uh, Nicalatos, and uh, Teruit. Uh, they, they're uh, more interested on uh, structural um, rules on the top of, uh, of uh, theories. And, and the case was not classical or intuitionistic, but it was intuitionistic linear logic. So I would mention these five works as changing uh, life kind of works, in, at least for me. Uh, and I, I should also mention this one. Uh, uh, so Gilles Dweck has uh, now a long time uh, project called Deduction Modulo Theories, where it's not exactly what I'm going to talk about, but was really inspiring for me at least uh, by at the end of my uh, PhD thesis. So I would mention him as well as a, as a very important reading for, for me uh, at the time. And now <laughs> days because uh, he's still working on this and it's uh, really nice. Uh, so I would, so this is, you say, when, when you have a nice topping and a, a nice idea, lots of, you know, people go and start working on that and uh, you have lots of very interesting works. So uh, what are we going to do? So I'm going to take the, the, the examples that uh, from this first paper I mentioned of Sara and uh, Von Plateau of 98. So all the examples are there. Uh, so suppose that you, you want, so you want to take as your mathematical theory, for example, uh, that you want that P implies Q for some atoms P and Q are valid and also P. And uh, you decide to put this as non-logical axioms. So the, this means that every time you, you reach a P implies Q or a P, you stop the, you stop the, the, the derivation, right? So 
now having this as, as non-logical axioms, you can prove Q uh, and the derivation is this one, it's, it's a simple one. The only, you know, small thing about this derivation is that it uses uh, Q, uh, cut two times, right? It uses cut here and here. Um, and uh, well, if you try to do collimination or to eliminate cuts, you can see that this is impossible. So this is a problem. And this was noted by Jiha. Actually, he was uh, it was his example in, in the book of 87. So this is a problem. So cut elimination, it, it is a problem and it is not a problem, but you know, um, by the time I was studying these things, not having cut elimination was a big problem. I know that resolution people don't, don't agree with me, but uh, it's okay. Okay, so okay, so non-logical axioms is not the way we're going to do the thing. So how about instead of putting the non-logical axioms, you you just put basic sequence. So more or less the same. When you get to the sequence, you stop, right? So again, you can prove Q uh, from uh, from these two uh, assumptions here, but you uh, you have to use cut, and you cannot eliminate this cut. So Q, the only proof that you have for Q uh, passes through cut. Okay, so then you have a problem and again. Uh, so this was noted by Gensen in, uh, in uh, 38. Right, so what else? So we can have some more, uh, at least two options for that. So uh, what we can do is uh, to assume the axioms as tiers. So I'm going to put the axioms in the context uh, of every single uh, sequence I want to prove, and then I can use them whenever I have to, right, or I want to. And uh, so, okay, so now you have a proof of Q, uh, assuming these two, uh, these two axioms as theories, uh, you have cut elimination, but you lack lots of other nice structural properties. So uh, this is not the way we wanted to, to go. And this was used by, uh, this technique was used by Gensen on his proof of uh, uh, consistency, consistency proof of elementary uh, arithmetic. Okay, so what, uh, what's the, 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 the mm, the setting we're going to, to, to choose then. We're going in the way that um, Simpson and, and Sara and uh, also uh, Agatha uh, did in Vienna, that would be to add, instead of ax axioms or, uh, um, or, or theories or this kind of things, we're going to add inference rules. Inference rules for what? In inference rules for atoms, okay? So we're going to transform that, uh, that um, two axioms that we had before into sequence rules. So here is the first sequence rule for P implies Q. So it means that in the presence of P implies Q, uh, every time that I use Q, uh, that C is a consequence of Q, then C is also a consequence of P because P is, let's say, stronger than Q in a sense, right? And the other one says that, okay, so if I prove C from P, I already have P there, so I don't need that P uh, there, so I can uh, drop it uh, top, uh, from top to bottom, uh, really in this way. So this is the, the line of, uh, of the, the work we're going to talk about today. And now we have a cut free proof of Q, uh, the same, but only using rules. Now we can really, really talk about sequence systems and, you know, uh, use the formalism as, as uh, the full power of the formalism. But the thing is that, um, okay, so this is, this is the way that uh, the stock is going to, to, to go. Uh, but the thing is, there are two questions there, right? Uh, so the first one is, uh, which mathematical theories we're going to put on the top of our, uh, of our first order uh, logic and why we're going to choose them, right? And well, there is a third question that is not there and how we're going to do this, right? So this is the fresh view to the old problem. So the problem is old, but the, the view using bipolars and focusing to have uh, uh, syntactic, syntactic inference rules for atoms is the new, uh, the new, the fresh view of, the, of this problem. So, and uh, so the, 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 the how is more or less explained here. So what we're going to do is uh, first inspired by the works of Agatha and all, uh, we're going to do a, a hier hierarchy of polarities of, uh, of uh, formulas. So we're going to give the polarities to, to formulas, to atoms and to formulas. And then uh, we're going to combine this with focusing. So we're going to give, a, um, to show you a discipline on doing proofs or derivations. So these two things com uh, combined is going to give us a, a systematic way of constructing 
uh, these rules for atoms. So this is the whole idea uh, of the of the talk, and the talk is going to be about this. So the the the, the way we're going to do this is systematic. So we're, we have an algorithm, and this was in, actually this was implemented. Uh, they implemented this in one uh, prologue. Uh, we have a prototype, and I'm going to talk about this later. We have a very a very nice thing that it'll be a uniform presentation for classical and intuitive first more uh, first order systems. Um, they are going to be done in parallel, so you don't need to move from one to the other. And uh, we have a generalization of some results that are in literature for so, for example, for geometric theories, the ones uh, given by by Sara and by Agatha and um, also by Vigano. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about this this works at, at the end as well uh, to to stress out what to pinpoint better what kind of results we're going to extend and what we're not going to extend, okay? And finally, uh, we're going to show that we have, on the, we can wrap up everything with a, a very easy uh, and nice cut elimination procedure. So we don't need, you know, extra power or extra reasoning. I mean, everything is in there. So this is going to close uh, the, the deal in a very nice uh, way. So, and uh, Sonia is going to talk about this. So, this is going to be the outline of the talk. So actually, I'm going to talk about the first two, uh, and then uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to talk about the, the first uh, the first topic. I'm going to talk about the polarities and bipolar formulas, and then Sonia is going to talk about focusing and bipoles, and uh, she is also going to talk about how to transform these axioms to to rules uh, using this framework that uh, I introduced it to you, and then I'll come back with some examples and uh, and and conclude the the talk. Okay. So it's going to be, as uh, Anna said, a very light talk. So let's let's move uh, to polarities and bipolar. So what do we mean by that? So as I said, we're going to 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 talk about very basic stuff. So it's going to be classical and intuitionistic logic. So we all know what uh, that uh, this is, and uh, the the language uh, that we have for there is the normal language that we, we are use it to, right? We have axioms, uh, atoms, and we have conjunction, disjunction, uh, the unities uh, for the constants for true and false, implication, and the quantifications, the existential and universal. So what we're going to do is to, first of all, polarize these things. So we're going to polarize the, the connectives, not all of them. So in the classical setting, we're going to polarize the, um, the conjunction, disjunction, and the, the constants uh, with positive and negative versions. Uh, the implication and the quantifiers you don't polarize. So the the the, uh, the implication and universal quantifier uh, are negative, while the existential quantifier is positive. And this is related to to focusing that um, uh, Sonia is going to talk about in a while. And uh, in the intuitionistic logic, you have almost the same. The only difference is that uh, for the disjunction and the false, you don't have the negative version. So you, you have everything but these two. Uh, so you're going to have positive and negative conjunction, for example, uh, true, uh, but not false or addition. So this is the only, the, the only you know, simple detail that's going to uh, be different uh, from one to the other, and that, that's it. So uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, how, what polarized formulas uh, mean. But uh, before doing that, so let me talk about atoms. So we're going to polarize everything. So I, 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 in this slide, I showed how to polarize the, the connectives, right? But we're going to polarize the atoms as well. And this is not our idea. Of course, this is something that you know came a long time ago in 95 uh, from uh, Dano, uh, Joanet, and Schlinix. And uh, the idea is the following. So suppose that you have uh, in the intersonistic setting, you have uh, this sequence here that you want to prove. So you have a context gamma and you have a formula A1 implies, implies A, A0. A1 and A0 are atoms and B is a formula. It doesn't matter. So uh, there are two, they, they in, this, in that paper 95, they established two protocols for that uh, in intuitionistic logic. The first one is that when you look at the right uh, premise here, uh, it, this branch is going to be trivial. So if you have an atom, uh, if, you, if you introduced an atom bottom up, really thinking bottom up, if you introduce an atom on the, on the left side, on the right premise, you should finish the proof there. 
So this means that for you to finish the proof with this A0 being principle, this means that A0 is equal to B, okay? So suppose that you have this protocol. So every time you do that, you finish the proof for that one and you, you have a, continu a continuation and the continuation is going to be the other premise or the left, left premise. So you can, uh, you can keep doing this thing. So you can generalize this thing. So if you have, so, so for example, if you have A1 implies A2, implies A3, implies A4, is all are going to be the tail and then you have A0 as the head, uh, you're going to move up the proof uh, if, you, if you choose every simple step to do the implication, to work on the implication that is left, you're going to end up with a, with a derivation like this where the, the right premise has to stop, as I say, it's trivial, but the left ones are alive, then they, they continue, right? So this is called, well, now, uh, nowadays, this is called the negative protocol. Uh, and this gives a flavor of back, back chaining, right? So you go, uh, you do back chaining. So uh, uh, you move um, uh, from the tail to the to the head. Okay. So now uh, you can you you have uh, the other protocol that that was presented is the positive protocol, and it's going to be the opposite. Instead of finishing uh, with the right branch, now I finish with the left branch. Okay. So this will be the protocol now. So I have a one implies a zero here. I continue with A0, so I continue to do the right branch and the left one, I finish it. Okay, so, you know, moving on and uh, having this with uh, the same example we had before where these A's are all atoms, right? So now you have to finish A1, A2, A3, A4, and you continue with the, with the head, that'll be A0, okay? So you continue with this one. So this is the positive protocol. And this is forward chain, right? You go for, you move forward uh, uh, in the other one, you move backwards on, uh, on, on the reasoning. Okay, but you, you can do nice things as well. So you now you can have a mixed protocol, right? Yeah, what's a mixed protocol? A mix, mixed protocol is like this. So suppose that you have A1 that now we are going to call them a negative. So everything that is in orange now it's negative and everything that is in a, a green is positive. So the protocol is the, the mixed protocol is going to be like this. So every time you have uh, a one um, that is positive, but it's on the it's on the tail of an implication, you have to finish the proof. And the same with uh, the head, but then you flip the polarities in, you flip the colors. So if you have uh, the the head of the implication and the head is negative, then you have to finish the proof. And uh, and if 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 you flip everything, then you don't you 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 move on with the uh, with the uh, with the both premises. So here you finish you 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 have to finish the proof. Here you the continuation is going to be both, and the other cases are where I have one or the other that I have to choose. Okay. So now suppose for example that you have a uh, one a i positive for i odd and a i negative for uh, i even. So now you can, uh, you know, flip these things and uh, you have a very nice way of talking about uh, different, the different pro protocols, they're going to be mixed together, right? Every time you see, you see um, an orange on the right, then you have to finish. Every time you see a green on the left, you have to finish. Otherwise you, you move on and you continue with the proof. Okay, so this is um, basically what I had to say about atomic formulas and the, um, and the protocols uh, in, this, uh, in this paper. Uh, let's move then to stratification and uh, to use the hierarchy of, of formulas. So this is really inspired on the works of Agatha. So the, I put two of them there. Uh, so the first one is uh, with uh, Nick Galatos. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so I'm, I keep talking while I come back. So the, one, the first one is uh, uh, it's with Nick Galatos and, uh, and uh, Terui. And, and the leaks uh, 2008, uh, 2008 um, conference. And uh, they worked with intersemistic linear logic and uh, they put structural uh, uh, rules on the top of it. And, uh, and they, it's, it's propositional. Uh, it's not, uh, doesn't have a universal quantifier. And the second one, they moved it from intersemistic linear logic to classical linear logic, again, without quantifiers. So this is really inspired on them. And the idea is pretty simple. So uh, you have uh, uh, you have one set of atoms. So you have positive and you have negative atoms, but they are 
just in one set. So I put here P0 and N0, but they're really the same set. So that's what this arrow is saying. And then we're going to construct on the top of this, we're going to construct the other formulas. So if I want to construct the formulas in N1, so they're going to be uh, built on, on the top of the atoms I had before, plus the negative, uh, the negative connectives. So the negative conjunction, disjunction, uh, implication, the universal quantifier, whatever. So atoms, and then now I can, I can put uh, negative uh, connectives. So I move up one layer. So now I'm in, in N1. I can do the same with uh, positive. So instead of going to N1, I can go to P1. So I can uh, choose two atoms. It doesn't matter the polarity of the atoms because they are in the same set. And then I just uh, put on the top of them uh, um, a positive connective. So now I have a positive formula that's going to be on P1. So P1 is built up uh, over the atoms with the positive connectives. And then for building N2, what I do is to take formulas in P1 and, uh, and combine them, for example, with uh, negative connectives again. So here I put a formula that is in, uh, in uh, N2. So this is in N2 because this formula here is positive, so it's in P1. So everything that is in P1 is also in N2. And implication is uh, really interesting because you know it's something something is going to be in in, P, in N2 if it is an implication, and then uh, the the the, ta the tail is, is is going to be in the P2 as well, and uh, the head is going to be in N2, right? So. In this way, you can move on and you can do this, uh, this hierarchy, build this hierarchy in a very uh, nice way. So I'm just uh, going to, to finish with, uh, before uh, talking about bipoles, I'm just going to put this in, in pictures. Um, Sonia did this very nice uh, representation of uh, what really does it mean to have this hierarchy mean. So suppose that you have this uh, negative formula here, and, uh, and I'm putting this because this is what really what we're going to, to, to work. Uh, so this is really what uh, Sonia is going to talk about in uh, two minutes or so. Um, so we're going to deal with axioms that have, for example, this shape. And what's this shape? The shape, it has positive uh, connectives like on the top, and then you go moving uh, on the structure of the, of the, the formula until you reach either atoms or negative, only negative fragments, right? And then you flip the polarity. So this is the idea. You start with positive on the, on the outside, like connectives. And then when you're going to move on to the proofs, then you're going to reach either atoms or uh, negative, um, negative structures, let's say. Um, the same you can do with a uh, negative. So you, you take one of these negative ones and then you, you go negative until you, you are going to find either positive or atoms as well, right? So you have a negative phase here and then you move up and then down actually. And then you're going to, 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 to reach only positive or atoms. So what this hierarchy does is really to flip polarities all the time. So you keep flipping polarities, okay? So the, 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 the nice catch about what we're going to talk about, and this is a catch that has been uh, there in the air for like a long time. Lots of people work with that, me included, is that when you flip, when you control the, the, the amount of flipping that you do in a very nice way, uh, you, can, you can do very nice reasoning uh, with this, with this class, right? So this, this is the class that we are really going to work with and we're really interested on. That would be the class of bipolar formulas. What bipolars? Bipolars are the class N2 either intuitionistic or classical, doesn't matter. So it means that I can even flip, I, I, started with, um, I started with atoms, I can flip once and get positive, and then I can flip again and get negative, and then I stop flipping. So this will be the, the flipping pains. So I can do that only at most twice. Okay, so the bipolar formulas is everything we're going to talk. And uh, it should be noted that uh, uh, it's not surprising at all because, you know, in Agatha's papers, they also, when they talk about sequence systems, they talk about N2. So this is really expected. So it, 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 as I said, it's a new view for some things that are in there. So we're going to give a fresh and different uh, view on that. Okay, so how do I polarize a formula? So first I polarize atoms. How? You name it, uh, the, the way you want. So it can be positive, it can be negative. 
it doesn't matter. This is not going to alter probability, but it's going to alter a lot the shape of proofs. And we're going to see this later. And then you polarize your, your constants and connectives. Just be, being careful that in intersinistic logic, uh, you don't have positive versions of disjunction and poles. Okay. Um, just to finish, then, uh, just a, a nice, ex at least I think this is a nice example where, you know, the turning point where you can, you really have to be careful. So if you take this formula here, it's a simple formula. So you have P1 implies P2 or uh, K1 key, key, key implies K2. Key uh, P1, P2, K1, K2, they are atoms. Uh, if I want to polarize them, so as I said, we can polarize the atoms at will as we wish but then when uh, the, the, the implication we don't pol polarize because the, it's negative already so you, you have nothing to do so if you want to polarize this formula you have to move to the disjunction and it can be in classical logic it can be either positive or negative and in, in uh, intersinistic logic it has to be positive because you don't have negative oh, uh, sorry <laughs> I said uh, wrong before so yeah so in, uh, in, in an intersinistic setting you have to be positive you don't have no it's the other way around. Uh, sorry. Yeah, you don't have you don't have the negative disjunction. You don't. You just have the positive uh, disjunction. So, in classical logic, if you polarize this way uh, with the with the negative disjunction here, then this is going to be a bipolar. Actually, this is going to be n one. This is a negative formula. You don't flip polarities. But if you if you put here um, uh, this, uh, a positive disjunction then you're, you're going to have problems because this is not a bipolar anymore. Why? Because you're going to flip the polarity. So here you have a, a negative, and then on the top of that, you have a positive, and this is not a bipolar. Okay? You, 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 you go to class P2, and then you're out of N2. So, uh, so yeah, so this is a formula that if we take this as, as an axiom, this would be reduced to or transformed into um, a, a rule. Uh, in classical logic, but not into synistic logic. So and now we are going to move to focusing, and uh, Sonia, it's all yours. Yes. Just a second. I arrive. Okay. Uh, are you done? Okay. Uh, Sonia, normally you should be able to talk now. Yes. Again. Okay. And is the image of Sonia uh, spotted? I think so. Okay. Yes. So um, Elaine introduced polarities and bipolar formulas. I'm going to introduce the second ingredients of our work, which is focusing and bipoles. So let's consider uh, the sequence again that we had uh, before. Um, and uh, we saw a few ways to, to, to derive it, but there are uh, many other ways. So if we want to prove it, we could have worked on gamma, we could have worked on B. Uh, there are many, many ways to proceed. Um, the way we were doing it before was to always work on that uh, implicational formula, A1 implies A2, etc., And to commit to repeatedly apply this left implication rule on the right premise until we reached that uh, A0 atomic formula. And this is known as focused uh, rule application. Um, so what, what, is, what is focusing more, more, more precisely? Um, well, it's an organizational tool for proof. It's a way to restrict the proof search um, in, a, in a nice organized ways while still remaining complete. The way to do that is by always applying invertible introduction rules whenever, um, whenever you can. And the other rules, the ones that are not invertible, the ones that are consuming external information, uh, you chain them together. 
So that will lead to a maximal chaining of the decomposition, like, like we were doing before with the implication. Uh, so if I take another example of this proof, well, if I look at it bottom up, um, it, it applies a rule to this orange formula, this uh, universal quantifier, then it moves to the blue one, which is an, ex an existential, then to the other existential, etc. It moves in a bit of an unorderly fashion. And in a focused uh, uh, proof, you would have to maximally chain. So when you start working on that orange universal, you have to go through with it and continue with the disjunction. And when you start working with the existential, you have to go through with it and continue with the disjunction. So that is the organize, organized, focused way of proving something. So you see you have a lot fewer options and therefore the proof search is cons constrained. Now, the way to build these proofs um, has been uh, done um, so, so we want systems, proof systems, that build only these organized proofs. And the systems we're using is LKF and LJF by Liang and Miller, and they, they, they enforce this sort of proof search behavior directly at the level of the structure. So for this, we use some extra uh, syntactic machinery. We have two kinds of sequence. We have the down arrow sequence, who, that will de decompose um, a formula that has been put in focus. So this, this here indicates a left focus on B and this here indicates a right focus on B. And basically whenever there is a down uh, arrow in a sequence, it means that any introduction rule working on the sequence will have to introduce that specific B. On the other hand, we have up arrow sequence that are used for the part of the proof where that is more free and that is concerned with invertible introduction rules. Now I show you an example of, of rules. So here we have a non-invertible rule which is the implication left and it has to work on a focus. So this is on the left, it has a focus on this implication and it keeps the focus on both of its premises. So now this is still a focus sequence, so the next rule will have to work on this on these subformulas B1 and B2, and therefore we'll have this chaining happening. And on, on the other hand, we have the invertible rules, for example, this right implication. So this is this this these two contexts are in the middle, but they are they, they are more free and they can be applied, but they, they still have all the formulas that can be decomposed by invertible rules still have to be decomposed um, to, to continue with this chaining. So how does proof search then and proof construction uh, works in, in such system? So we always start with a sequent that is what we call the border sequent, which has empty context uh, in, in, in between the, in between the, the arrows. One formula will be put under focus and we'll, uh, we'll flip the arrow and decide, we call it decide, on a formula uh, either on the left or on the right to, fo to focus on. Then we will apply some, some focus rule and the focus, as I said before, will be transferred from conclusion to premises until either one of these two things happen. Uh, either the, 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 the formula here is, is, uh, is not possible to apply anymore um, focus rule on it, so we have to f to 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 release this focus and and enter an, uh, a, f a phase of applying invertible rules, either on the left or on the right. Or, well, we can also be in a case where the derivation can be closed, can be closed by an initial initial rule, either on the left or on the right. This is when we have reached an atom. If we're in the first case and the focus is released, then we are eagerly decomposing this, this formula here into, into its subformulas, um, which then will be stored in the context for later decide. So here we, 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 we have decomposed um, we have decomposed some, some subformula until until uh, 
until it's not possible to apply any more invertible rule to it, so we'll just store it. So now we have, we have this organization that I was talking about before, which, which alternate between what we call synchronous phases, where we are um, under focus, and asynchronous phases when we are applying eagerly invertible rules. Um, and if we, if we look out and abstract from all this, um, all this phase, so, so yes, of course, once we have stored everything, we will go back to a decided and, and, and loop and, and cycle. Uh, but if we look at only these, these, uh, these sequence that have empty things just before a decide happened or just after everything has been stored, we have border sequence. And in between this border sequence, what we have is what we call synthetic rules. And we want to look at specific synthetic rules that can be obtained in such a way. And the specific synthetic rules that we are interested in are bipoles, what we call bipoles, or what is called in the literature bipoles, actually, it's not only us. Um, so a bipole for a given formula B is a specific synthetic rule. It, it starts with a decide on B. It starts with a decide on B. It, it, it has a synchronous phase, then an asynchronous phase, and that's it. No, no asynchronous rule applied um, below a synchronous rule. And finally, at the end, during the storage phase, it only, only atomic formulas are stored. No bigger subformulas. So if you look at it uh, a bit uh, more like intuitively, so this is exactly what I said. This would be a bipole for B because it starts with a decide on B. It has a synchronous phase where the focus persists. It has an asynchronous phase where we apply all these, the possible invertible rules eagerly. And at the end, in the phase of storage, only atoms are stored. And we are looking between this border sequence and these border sequence. So that's the specific synthetic rules that we're going to look at. And the rules, um, the, 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 the rules that we extract from this. So this is, this is a derivation in um, the polarized focus calculus. And if we, if we look at it abstractly, we can say that we can synthesize a rule from it that starts with this gamma and delta um, context variable and ends, will end with this, um, with this new newly created uh, context as premises. So this is kind of a, like a compactification of this whole, this whole derivation. So we say that this synthetic rule is justified by this derivation and or, or, or this derivation can be synthesized into this inference rule. Right, so now we have all our ingredients for revisiting the axioms of, as rules uh, tradition. Uh, which are the bipolar formulas and the bipoles. So the first result connects these two things. So basically, for a polarized uh, negative formula, if it is bipolar, then any synthetic inference rule for B, so obtained in the way that I, um, that I described, will be a bipole. It will manipulate only atomic formulas. But very importantly, this, the, we also have the converse result, which is that if every synthetic inference rule for B is a bipole, then B has to be of the specific shape of the bipolar formulas. It has to be in the N2 class of the uh, polarity hierarchy that was uh, described by Elaine. Um, so so, so that's, that's very interesting because, because um, usually the results in the literature are that if a formula is a, in a certain class, it will, uh, pro it will be possible to integrate it as a certain inference rule. But in our case, we have the, 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 the opposite result that only if it is in that class, it will be uh, possible to have an inference rule for it, uh, which is a much stronger. The second very, very important... <sighs> The second very, very important result that um, 
we have in, in uh, our paper is that, um, sorry, uh, technology, okay. Um, second very important result that we have in our paper is that the, the system obtained with um, adding these new inference rules from, for LK or LJ is um, admits cut. Um, and, and, and this is what makes everything works. This is what uh, shows that our method is complete because as Elaine said, um, we can, if we were to add our axioms as axioms or our theories, we wouldn't have cut elimination. But when we replace with this, with this technique, uh, we obtain uh, systems that have cut elimination. And very interestingly, the proof is very simple because it's, it's a direct uh, consequence of the fact that it, a polarized version of cut is admissible in the focus system because because um, all rules are just uh, abstraction of what happens in, in the focus system. So once we have these two uh, main results, uh, we, can, um, we can develop the, 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 the method uh, in a safe way. So we can always create rules from axioms and we will always have a um, sound and complete system uh, that, admits cut, um, that admits cut. So if I show you an on an example, um, let's say that uh, we start with uh, an axiom like this, that is unpolarized, um, and we polarize it. We can have many different polarization. Elaine explained uh, how um, uh, different polarization can arise from, from one, a given axiom. Uh, and then we ask, is it bipolar? For the first one here, yes, it is. So we know that it will, it will correspond to a bipole. And we can see here, indeed, we are only manipulating atomic uh, subformulas of our, of our axiom. Once we know it's a, it's a bipole, well, we've shown that we can just synthesize an inference rule for LK. And, and this system, once, once adding this rule to LK, will still have a cut admissibility. And, well, the, the, the other polarization could give us uh, another bipolar formula. So if we look at this other formula where I only switched the polarity of n and q, uh, well, it is it is uh, it is also bipolar. It is also bipolar, so it will correspond to a bipole in LKF as well. That is slightly different, given that the polarization of n and q are slightly different. And it will be able to and will be able to synthesize a different inference rule. Um, and, and add this inference rule for to to LK as well, preserving still a cut elimination. Um, but that doesn't mean that all the polarization of our axiom are bipolar. So we could have a different polarization where here I add an extra polarity uh, uh, shift, and that will um, uh, cause this this axiom to fall into the P um, P three uh, no N three category. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this will not be bipolar anymore and we won't be able to transform it into, into a, a rule. But still from this axiom, we could at least create two rules and we can add them to LK and preserve elimination. And I think I leave it to you again. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry to remind you that you should conclude because we are a little bit over on the time. So, you know, if we want to have some questions, uh, you should try to conclude. No, it's completely okay. So um, I'm going to just give you uh, some examples and then finish the, conclude the talk. So, uh, 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 so let's,
move to the examples. So uh, the first one, so as I said in the beginning, right? I mean, the motivation, the great motivation for that was uh, geometric axioms, right? So um, let's start with them. Why geometric axioms? Because geometric axioms are simple, uh, at least uh, Simpson put this way, right? They have a very simple form. Actually, this is a kind of normal form for geometric implications. Um, for focusing, really, we don't, we don't, we don't care. I mean, we could, uh, we could have any, any shape. Uh, if it is falls into N2, then it's okay. So, so I'm not going to talk about this, but it's a uh, really simple. So you have a universe, universally quantified formula where you have an implication here and the implication has a very, uh, very easy shape in the sense that uh, the tail is a conjunction of atoms and uh, while the head is a disjunction of, um, of uh, a disjunction of uh, existentially quantified conjunction of atoms, okay? So it's really simple and you can model lots of things uh, using this, uh, this kind of uh, formulas. And uh, then well, what, what can you do? You can, you can give polarities to either the, the atoms or, or the connectives, right? So you can give either conjunction or disjunction, positive or negative and also with the atoms. Implication and existation and universal quantifiers, no, because uh, uh, they, are, they have already their own polarity. So let's suppose that we, we, uh, we give uh, for this uh, formulas here on the tail, uh, we give them a positive polarity, right? Uh, and uh, for the other atoms and the other things, we just don't care, right? So if we do that, and uh, we use the method that uh, Sonia just described, we're going to have a bipole, uh, of course, and then this bipole is going to be synthesized into this, uh, into this rule here. And this is a very well-known rule in the, in the literature. So uh, Sara and uh, also uh, Simpson and uh, also Agatha, they work it with, the, with this formula, with this formalism, let's say, of putting, of adding uh, axioms, uh, uh, rules for axioms into first order systems. Systems, right. So what you do is really, I mean, you have a, you have a, a bunch of atoms here on the on the left, and you have a bunch of atoms on the right. They are going to be inside this ends. And what happens is that you're going actually what how you read this formula bottom up is that you're going to substitute p for the q's and everything on the left, right. So this is the geometric scheme that uh, that Sara uh, uses on her papers and uh, on the in the book as well. But what happens if instead of having here uh, positive polarities for atoms, if I change to negative, then uh, what we're going to do is uh, it's a, a kind of a flip kind of behavior because now here you're not going to substitute P for Q anymore, bottom up, but what you're going to do bottom up is just to add the Q's, the, the, the Q's and the P's as well, right? So now instead of having only N premises where N is the name of uh, these formulas that you have here on the head, now you're going to have n plus m premises for all the, the atomic formulas. So you're going to introduce all the atomic formulas at once. Okay. So and uh, the, the things that is that you you flip the polarity of p. So you see here the p appears on the left. But then I flip the polarity of p. Then now p ap appears on the right. Right. So every time I flip polarities, I flip something in the in the in the in the rule in the in the rule that we're going to end up with. So uh, in the same uh, series of works, they also have uh, co what they call co-geometric implications. They have this shape here. Now what you're going to flip is the tail with the head of the formula. And so now we have again uh, choices to make. So I can make the, the, the atoms negative again. And uh, if I make the atoms negative, I'm going to substitute the piece for the cues, but now they are going to be on the right. So, you know, you flip, 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 and now you have this, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this uh, group uh, for S4 group here, right? Uh, but you can also have the, um, you can also have the, the uh, instead of having negative atoms, I can have positive atoms. So see what you do is, uh, so here you're going to substitute the P for the cues for the negative atoms. And now you're going to, you, you're not going to substitute anymore. You're going to add everything to S premises. And remembering that, you know, here I was in the right and it was negative. And here I'm in the left with a piece and uh, it's positive. So you have this kind of flipping. And it, it, with that, so in the literature, you're only going to have this uh, kind of uh, formulation. But now you have more choices. And of course, I'm doing 
and all the datums on the on the head here are positive, but I can mix them, and then I have many rules, right? Mixing these two these two ways of doing things. There is a simplification of uh, of uh, universal axioms that that is called uh, of geometric axioms. They are called universal axioms, so they are a simplification of this. And if you do the same trick of you know of um, putting polarities to the tail. Uh, and then you're going to have different uh, formulas as well. So this is well known in the literature. Again, you're going to substitute P by Q. Uh, but if you change uh, the polarities of the atoms uh, on the head, then you're going to substitute Q by P. And then you have all this kind of dualities just playing with the polarities, okay? Uh, you can either, even oversimplify the thing and have horn clauses. And what happens is that when you have everything positive, you're going to have the forward chaining that we've been talking about at the beginning of the talk. And this is what really Sarah and uh, Simpson and Agatha has been doing. And if you have negative, then you go to backward, uh, back chaining, and then this is really what we're going to uh, use it to do. Okay. I have here some examples, but uh, I'm going to, to skip them. Uh, this is just uh, to show you how the how we can uh, move to implement this thing. So they did this uh, this implementation in Lambda Prolog. So in the, the way that you just you put the formula in there, and then it's going to give you the the inference rule at the, at the end, right? So this is the the rule of uh, of paths in graphs. So and, and it's the same as transitivity. So if you have uh, positive atoms, you're going to have this behavior. If you have negative atoms, you're going to have this behavior. So just you know, flipping atoms, you have different uh, rules, right? And the same here, it, it's a very nice example by Zidowek, thank you, uh, in set theory. And uh, this is not geometric axiom, so we're moving up. Uh, so there are bipoles that are not geometric, just to tell you that we can handle them and the program can also handle them. So uh, you again have the positive negative difference between polarities of atoms and then resulting uh, systems. So this is, this is it. I mean, uh, I, I had here uh, some discussion, but I think we can, uh, I can leave the discussion to people that are really interested on the differences and uh, things that we did here and that people didn't do there, what people that did there and we didn't do here. And uh, there are lots of very interesting, fascinating uh, things about this, but uh, we're not going to do that now. And just to conclude, I mean, uh, what Sonia and I talked about uh, is a, in a joint work with Dale and Marco Volpe was uh, really to present you a very nice way of putting axioms into first order uh, systems and uh, how playing with polarities, we can have different rules and how these different rules are or not in the literature appearing here and there, popping here and there. Uh, we move it over, um, we move it over geometric uh, formulas, uh, but also uh, Agatha did the same. So the same result, uh, uh, she, has more, she has more or less the same result for N2. So this classification is a very uh, step forward and it's nice. Uh, and we have a very nice implementation. And in the, in the future, we, we, we plan to see what's, what's beyond that. So how can we generalize somehow uh, focusing and bipoles, this is focusing and bipole setting to another frameworks of settings. So that's it. So uh, thank you very much. In my own language, obrigada. And Sonia would say merci. I'm not sure that she can, uh, maybe you can unmute and say it a very nice way. Thank you, merci. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Elena and Sonia. Uh, are there questions? Um, Please raise the blue hand if you want to ask a question uh, or else, and then I will un allow you to, to talk. Or otherwise, um, write in the um, question and answer <clears throat> tab. Uh, while we wait for question, I have a question. Um, so you have shown how bipolars uh, correspond to uh, synthetic roots. Bipolars are a specific class of uh, first order formulae. So what happens if one looks beyond? Yeah, so that's, that's a very nice question. And uh, so this is the, the feature work that I put here. Actually in the paper, so this is a paper that we just, just submitted to um, Annals of Pure and Applied uh, Logic. And uh, in the paper, we have some insights of what 
could happen if we move beyond focusing and, and bipoles, right? Um, actually, so um, Sara has a, has a work on that um, where she generalized this kind of uh, reasoning, but instead of having a sequence, so Agatha and uh, we also showed that if you move, uh, uh, if you move over N2, then you're not going to have sequence uh, anymore, sequence rules anymore. You move e either to hyper sequence or something else. Uh, so it'll be more or less the same here. So we, we, we don't know yet. So uh, focusing on, on it's really adequate, comes together with bipoles, right? If you move outside the bipoles, then we have to either go to the systems of uh, sequence as uh, Sara does or hyper sequence. So we're, we're still wondering how can we move to this. And actually, uh, Agatha has a very nice uh, paper in, I think it's in Toco now, relating this uh, system of rules of Saras with uh, uh, hypersequence. So it's interesting. So yeah, that's not our next, next step. Thank you. And then yet another question about possible future work. I don't know. Um, so you've been working with intuitionist and classical logic in a uniform way. What about substructural logic, like for instance, linear logic or other? Yeah, and this is this is also a very good question. So, uh, um, so, so the cut elimination that we have is uh, really it's it really takes into account that you you're going to use uh, that you allow contraction. So, we're not sure. The, what we can answer is that if you have inter intermediate logics between intuitionistic and classical, and you handle this with uh, labels, then everything that I said here it's going to work uh, for, for this labeled uh, kind of calculi, calculi as well. Thank you. Uh, rather than in the question and answer uh, tab, I've seen a question in the chat, but I read it aloud anyway. It's a question by Yoni Zohar. Do function symbols make any difference to the framework? Do you treat equality as a distinguished symbol? Uh, this is a very good question. So yeah, so um, so what Roy Sada and Roy did in their work was to show that every single first order axiom that you take, you can you have they have a kind of scholemization uh, way of uh, of um, uh, transforming this axiom into um, into a geometric or uh, conjunction of geometric implications. And they for that they use only a, a finite for a, for an atom you use only a finite numbers of uh, function symbol, so it can be done. So this is something that I was going to do in the discussion. So you can take their result and uh, move, it, take any first order formula in classical logic, uh, scholamize it, and then you're going to have a conjunction of uh, uh, geometric implications, and then they are bipolar, then we can polarize and uh, we can uh, produce the, lots of uh, you know, uh, rules with that. So this is a very inter interesting question. Yeah, if we treat equality as, yes, we do uh, treat equality as distinguished symbol, yes. So, but, uh, well, it, it's a proposition, it's a proposition, maybe, we, mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, yeah, so this is something uh, I was talking to, to Sonia the other day that it would be nice to integrate the, the work that, uh, the, the last work I think that Roy did with, with Sara in our work, I think we could uh, we could uh, profit from this kind of uh, things, but only to 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 uh, to highlight that this only works in classical setting, right? Uh, not in the intuitionistic setting. In the intuitionistic, I would know how to do it. Very good. Thank you. Well, I think that there would be other questions and interesting ones, but maybe we can leave them to other moments, to the famous coffee breaks, uh, for instance. And so uh, now we conclude this invited talk and thanks again. <laughs>